So now if you want to go, uh, the, the, the problem now we've seen, there's a limit for the orbital zygomatic. Sorry. The limit of the orbital zygomatic is that I, I cannot go too down in the petroclival region posterior force, I have some limit. Limit is done by the limit of the posterior cranial neck. So if I have a lesion which is a little bit more inferior, I need to use a more lateral approach. That's what we're going to use now. We're going to use either anterior, we're going to consider, or we're going to see the anterior uh, transtemporal, posterior transtemporal, or the combined one. That gives me much better exposure to the inferior portion of the clivus and the entire Petroclival region, cerebral upon the angle, perimetencephalic brainstem. So this all everything lateral from anterior to posterior, basically almost all clivus. The only limit I have in this one is the jugular bulb, which is at this level. So everything below the jugular bulb, I need to use something a little bit more inferior, right? So let's see the difference. That's a nice animation to show you the difference between the the, the two. For example, this orbital zygomatic trajectory. Anterolateral, this basically is basal artery with the clivus, this is the old clivus, right? So now I have many options. I can go from anterolateral or I can go in the same region, look at this orbital zygomatic, this is the trajectory of the orbital zygomatic, or I can go to the same region laterally, so transpetrosal, whether I use anterior petrosal, posterior petrosal, translap, transcochlear, but giving me a much shorter trajectory, much, much more direct. The only problem is that. If I have an aneurysm, for example, it's pointing, pointing laterally, if I come from lateral, the first thing I encounter is the aneurysm. So I have no surgical control. So in that case, I would prefer to go anterolateral, right? So by in, order, in order to do that, I need to have more eggs in my basket. It means I need to understand all this approach. I don't need to be, that's the message I give to the young guys. I don't need to be conditioned in my approach just because I only know, I only master that trajectory. That's why the, we go back to the initial guidelines and suggestion. Be humble, trying to learn and not, don't tell the patient this is the best, no, this is the best approach I know. So instead of being, having to do that, just learn how to do everything when you're young, right? So you have more options and then you decide which one is better. I'm going to tell you which one is better, but you decide on your own. But it's good to have more eggs. So for example, here, I can go from lateral, I can go from mantra, that's the old point. Let's see a little bit technical aspect of the subtemporal approach. Uh, it's useful for, uh, for aneurysm or the basal teeth um, at the level of the posterior cranial process. It, the problem with the, the simple subtemporal approach, I cannot go, I have basically the same kind of exposure as far as retrocella as the anterolateral because I have the petrous ridge and I'm going to show why. I'm a petrous ridge of my trajectory, so I'm going to see too much inferior to the pitiful switch. But it's very good for aneurysm of the basal teeth, particularly if it's a high riding basal teeth. And also for neoplasm cysts and vascular malformation involved at the territorial notch, the medial temporal lobe, or lateral aspect of the mesencephalon. Right? Surgical position, I, this is my preference. I always use a pad, a gelatin pad on this side, I try to lift a little bit the shoulder. Um, and then I, I turn the head on the other side, the vertex down again, it's very important position because although the, is, uh, the, the head is elevated, as so uh, compared to chest, but still vertex down, because here yeah, I want to temporal lobe manipulation, it causes a lot of troubles, a lot of trouble, a lot of post complication. That's why a lot of times, although this approach is technically very simple, a lot of surgery around the world, you'd be surprised, they don't do it because the potential complication rate. So you can avoid this one by a good positioning, taking chance of good, the gravity, so the temporal lobe would fall back, good arachnoid dissection, and cutting the tentorium. Just all this, this maneuver will, uh, will uh, grant you a little bit more exposure and less need for brain retraction. And basically, there is different, again, I don't want to be dogmatic. You, know, uh, you don't have to do this approach like this, the skin incision. This is very simple. Most of the time, because now I use a lazy ass, so just don't, don't disregard it. It's just for understanding, basically, the anatomy, the topographic anatomy. But usually what I do, I do a linear incision behind the hairline at this level. I don't do this much. I mean, uh, because they go for obvious cosmetic reasons. Right? But I just want you to grab the concept of the anatomy, the topography at this level. 
So basically, the most important thing to just uh, facilitate the, your goal or less brain attraction is go as flush as possible with middle fossa with the bone flap, right? So I start with a single burrow, I go all the way down, I try to be as flush as possible with the base, so I don't have to chew any extra bone at the end, particularly for cosmetic purposes, but, but mostly because I want to make sure that I don't need to retract that temporal lobe too much. Oh, sorry. So you can see now the bone is actually begin with this one. This is shown with the Lexel, with the Ronger. Usually I use a drill just to go as flat, as flush as possible because my the dura opening, I just want to be as flush. Look, I open the dura, trying to be now this where you really want to make sure you angle the microscope properly because this spatula, although you still need some amount of the retraction, but you want to minimize it. So positioning bone resection until the end, um, angle the microscope. And then finally, we cut the arachnoid. The arachnoid the section is very important. Remember, in this case, the vein or bay in here. And then you just you protect the vein or bay with an absorbable gelatin sponge. And um, um, you can use the other, the other option, the other precision you can use is a lumbar spinal drainage and uh, manitol, just because you want to shrink the brain and trying to, again, always to uh, minimize brain attraction. The arachnoid is in size, it's usually a, a number 11 uh, blade knife. The other thing is important while you cut the arachnoid to identify the ocular motor name, the trochlear name. And again, I don't go in detail because it sounds more like a surgical uh, course kind of thing, but it's, this is very important. It seems, sounds very simple, but to avoid complications, you really want to understand them early in surgery to understand what the ocular motor name, the trochlear name are going to be because the relationship of the trochlear and the tentorium, the three-edge tentorium, is peculiar. So when you're going to manipulate that level, there's very high chance to cause some complication, right? So knowledge of anatomy is extremely important. And now you can see the edge of the tentorium is tucked uh, lateral to the floral middle cranial fossa, with the, in this case, with the inter interrupted suture. Uh, and the stitch of the tentorium is placed anterior, uh, anterior to the trochlear neck. Right, uh, which you need to identify properly because it runs just alongside the tentorium. And uh, the, this you can see the trochlear nerve, the tentorium, so this is anterior to the trochlea, and the ocular motor nerve is used as a landmark for orientation. This is the right side, so I can see very quickly because this, uh, the, the ocular motor nerve is anterior to the trochlea. Now, the anterior protosis is the same approach as the subtemporal. But the difference is as a, as a, a little bit more inferior, uh, the, the, the bone flap is exactly the same. But what we're going to do is just cut the petrus ridge, basically, resecting the petrus ridge, which is an obstacle when you're trying to get a lesion there a little bit more inferior. Let's say, for example, a lesion on this side. You can see this is the petrus ridge. So it means the lesion is going on both sides, superior and inferior to the petrus ridge. Basically, that, this picture here means that if I'm coming from lateral, through a subtemporal projection, I'm going to access everything above the petrous ridge, but everything below the petrous ridge is going to be hiding underneath the, the petrous apex. And a lot of surgeons, when they do, they pull up the lesion, they blindly dissect the inferior lobe, and then eventually they don't really, and they don't really can see the relation between the inferior lobe or the lesion and the ICA, for example, or the, the sixth nerve, which is underneath, is running on the brainstem. Uh, from medial to lateral, from inferior to superior that level. So what you want to do is just cutting the petrous apex, basically. So just to make sure, to show you a little bit better. So basically, when I do a subtemporal, I come from this trajectory, so I have a good exposure of the upper clivus, upper petroclival region. But if a lesion is a little bit more inferior, I have this, this petrous apex on my trajectory, right? So I need to get rid of it. That's why anterior petrosectomy. Um, is it simple? It's not very simple because, again, needs a lot of training because of the, the temporal bone is particularly packed up with, with a neovascular structure inside. And you need to drill that bone, make sure that you spare the structure. You need to pass by the structure. So that needs a lot of training in the, 
in the lab, in courses and stuff like that. That's why I'm trying to stimulate your interest. You know? Uh, there are a lot of lesions that can, be, can benefit from the transpilose, acoustic neuroma, meningioma, metastasis, neuroma. There's many of them. I don't want to list all of them, just two examples. But you can see the difference. Uh, and again, it, this is a good picture from the Jackal Atlas. You know, the difference be going all the way to a retro seat, all the way down to the clivus, but I still have some, some, uh, there's some, some obstacle, right? The problem you need a good confidence with drill. Now that's what uh, uh, Dr. Evans was emphasizing a lot. That's what we work a lot in the lab, understanding the anatomy first before the guys that do the approaches understand the anatomy. There's no point in doing the approach if they don't understand the anatomy. And once you understand thoroughly the anatomy, the approach comes as a consequence because all you have to do, you work around it, right? It's not simple because extreme confidence, particularly as you can see in this one, the bone is completely covered in this side. This is the Peter's apex I was talking about. So it's a piece of bone, but if you look underneath, you have all this structure. Underneath. So really you need to, and then you, basically you need to pass this small corner in here, in this little place, but in order to do that, you need to expose somehow these structures, internal carotid artery, the cochlea. So if I take this one, of course, you understand the disaster. If I take the cochlea, the patient's going to lose the ear. If I damage the fission nerve, it's going to the fission nerve pulses. And this again, the healing for the vestibular nerve the, and, and then the, the balance and stuff like that. So I need to work in this narrow corridor. And this way of just making better, we do this one in courses. And again, it just goes beyond the, the, the purpose now of this lecture. But from many corners, and then we, I've been using this one. I used this animation when I had more time when I was working years ago at the bar. Um, I, don't, I don't have time anymore about this, but um, we still use for lecture. Understanding anatomy, I was very, uh, for me, it was very important to understand anatomy from an embryological standpoint, because by knowing this, it would be, be much easier to understand the transition of bone, for example, when you use the drill and stuff like that. In particular, as you can see in this animation, the relation between different area and neighboring structure to avoid bothersome bleeding and stuff like that. This is uh, one other animation I used to use to understand the bone anatomy of the Peter's bone. For example, this is a Peter's bone I can place in any um, orientation. Basically, I put in transparency. Okay, in transparency allows me, this is left side, allows me to see very well what's underneath the bone, basically, and where to place my drill. And again, we go thoroughly about this one in the courses. And usually, my fellows spend an entire week in just doing this approach before they, they, they actually they show me how to. Um, and again, just we, this is the Peter's apex. We work in this angle. In this space between, which is medial to the intrapetrous carotid, anterior to the fissure nerve, and medial to the cochlea. Basically, you need to identify the structure in order to spare them. And finally, you draw and you take the bone out. And finally, you have a beautiful view of the, once you cut the entorium and open the dura, you have a nice view of the cerebello pontine angle, petroglival region, all the way from the seventh, you can see. So the limit is below the seventh. I cannot go below the seventh, my beautiful exposure above the seven and eight. And this is very nice, uh, uh, I, just to show you the progression of that section, this is a left side, temporal bone left side, so this middle fossa floor, this is a trigeminal nerve. You can see the progression, see the carotid, trapezius carotid, uh, GSPN, and finally you can see the internal acoustic canal, and this is the anterior pterosecton. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.